Hey everybody, uh, good day and thank you for joining our next SimScale webinar and um, talking about the stack effect within ventilation systems. There will be two of us today, so my name is John Wild, I'm the VP of Customer Success here with SimScale. Um, I've only been with the company less than a year, but I've got a lot of experience um, running CFD throughout, I don't know, quite a few years now and like running different teams and working within different industries. I'm joined by my colleague, Jesus. Um, he's an application engineer on the team. Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, I'm aerospace engineer. I did my master in CFD and just joined SimScale a few months ago, and I was responsible for this uh, webinar on all the simulation. Yeah, he did a nice job. You'll see as we go. <laughs> it looks very cool. <laughs> okay, so the agenda for today, um, I want to talk a little bit about just using simulation generally, sort of not talking about SimScale at all, um, and then we'll drill into how SimScale can help with simulation and then more specifically around the stack effect. Um, so we'll talk about you know, what we're going to um, model, and then I'll run through the setup with a live demonstration, and then we can talk about some results as well. And feel free to ask questions as we go, just type them into the panel on your screen. Um, we tend to have questions at the end, but if you know anything's kind of relevant as we go, then we'll speak to it at the time. Okay, so to start off with just talking about the benefits of using simulation generally. Um, so we used to live in a world without simulation, you know, where we had to basically man manufacture everything um, and test it. And if it didn't work, we would make it again. Now we live in a different world where we can test everything before we make any prototypes or hopefully just the final design. So we can figure out, you know, is, is the design going to work? Is it going to fail? And um, in this instance, is the building going to give it like a nice thermal comfort internally? Um, will there be regions of drafts or would there be regions where the occupants would be too warm or too cold? So we can do all of this without you know ever having to build anything. And obviously with a, something on a building scale, you want to get it right first time. Um, we can also reduce costs so we can look to optimize the design. You know, are there are there things we simply don't need? Um, so we have a couple of um, cooling units within the building, but maybe we only need one. So we could again, you know, reduce costs. So that would reduce costs for us and also for the end user. So some of the benefits as well, just for AEC, and um, we can look at different things. So SimScale runs, um, or simulation generally, you know, we can look at things on a very small scale, or we can go up to the larger scale like we're going to do today. So we can look at um, HVAC systems, so that is actively cooling or heating a room. But then we might look at not just forced ventilation, but natural ventilation. So we open a window or a door, or we look at drafts and have the the room kind of running at a nice optimal temperature without any additional energy being used. Um, and that again obviously connects to improving energy efficiency. We can look at contamination and air quality control. So this building might be next to a road um, and we're really kind of then concerned about how many, how much of the air comes from one side where the road is perhaps there's fumes and we want to make sure you know that actually air is leaving the building on that side and not coming in. So all of these kind of things we can answer with simulation. So a little bit about who we are. Um, we've been around now for about seven years, and our goal, and you know, I've used simulation for a lot longer, and my, I guess my experience in simulation is um, running on really large and expensive machines locally. Um, but the SimScale goal is different. So the idea was to run on cheap machines and use everything in the cloud. So you need no local or expensive hardware, um, but we can leverage the cloud for everything. So we can run on enormous machines um, all through a browser and that really lightens up the load and obviously reduce the, reduces the cost for every um, of our customers as well. So SimScale has everything in one um, you can run the types of simulations we're running today for the um, AEC industry. Uh, we can also run FEA um, so we could do look at um, structural analyses or heat transfer analyses. Everything is included within one package. We have and this is within my team too and I'm really proud of it as well. We have real-time support I haven't seen this from any other company, honestly, and it works really, really nicely. So basically, when you're within the product, you can just hit a speech bubble, which you'll see when I'm demoing in a little bit, and you have an immediate connection with somebody in the company. So we can actually give you help when you need it, you know, not having to log a ticket and wait for hours or days. We can help you there and then. And the fact that it's all cloud-based, um, you can switch a small toggle and we can immediately see your project as well. So it's private until you choose for it not to be, but then when you want it to be public or want it to be shared with us internally, we can immediately see it and start to help you. And so we can give you really relevant and timely support. Um, it's definitely fast and it's definitely easy to use. You'll see, I think, from the interface, and hopefully you'll get a feeling for that today. It's also cost efficient. You know, we don't, we don't, or you at least wouldn't need anything upfront. Um, 
or any kind of local machinery up front to run SimScale. We, we all run on uh, laptops without even GPUs because we simply don't need them. Everything is done remotely. Okay, so talking about the stack effect from today, um, and Jesus, feel free to jump in if there's anything I missed. I mean, you made this beautiful webinar, right? So <laughs> if there's anything you want to share, then you're more than welcome to. Um, basically, the stack effect works when we have um, a difference in temperature primarily, or height as well. So you can see here there's a building where we have um, low uh, air entering and cooler and the lower levels. And obviously it heats up inside through various different reasons, partly maybe through heating or just from the occupants even. And then the hot air rises as it as it leaves the top. And that's what we want to look at today. And primarily focusing, initially at least, we're focusing really around the chimney and how that um, affects all of the airflow internally. So whether you're looking at the winter and you might have a fireplace inside, um, or you're looking at the summer when you might have active cooling to bring the temperature down. And what really happens inside a building? So we have like lots of different ways for the flow to enter and exit. And you simply don't always know what is going to happen. So with simulation, we can start to answer those questions. So here we're looking at two different scenarios. On the top, we have the winter scenario. Um, so there's heat being added internally. And there's cool air entering. So normally, most windows have some kind of region for air to enter or exit. Um, in the winter, it tends to enter lower down. And then as it's heated, it exits higher up. In the summer, um, the opposite normally happens. So the air enters at the top and it's normally cooled internally and then it would um, exit lower down. Yeah. yeah you want to add right. anything? No, no, it's perfect so far. <laughs> I feel like I'm being critiqued as I go. It's perfect. Um, I thought we would also, or well, Jesus um, thought, and very sensibly so, that we would include at least this page um, so we can explain some of the variables that control the stack effect. So really the, the height, so the difference in density of the fluid and the temperature gradients are what drive the flow from to move from one place to another. And like keep that in mind as we start to walk through and then start to look at some of the results too. So some of the results you'll see because we have a very um, high temperature differential in regions, the flow moves pretty quickly because the density is different and it has to move from one to the other to keep a balance. So we used um, within SimScale the analysis type called convective heat transfer. And that is basically allowing us to have um, the air will act normally and with buoyancy. So if it heats up, the density would reduce and it would rise. So we then obviously need to tell SimScale which way gravity is acting. Um, and the heat would rise naturally, exactly like you're seeing in this, in this image. So obviously there's um, some wind coming from the left and it's moving everything to the right. I'm glad this is actually really accurate, this given yeah. is perfect. <laughs> so all of the flow is moving to the right. And it's also rising, right, because it's warmer than the surrounding air, so it's rising. So most air like that moves kind of diagonally upwards. So the solver that we're using, we would use um, both for natural convection, um, but we could also use it just for force convection. So if the, the buoyancy effects weren't even super, neg um, yeah, they, I guess if the buoyancy effects were almost negligible, we could still use this for force convection if we wanted to. So that's more like the summer condition that we have. So the winter... Um, the flow is pretty well naturally convected. Um, the fire, obviously, that we have in induces a lot of flow. But then in the summer case, we have some cooling units, and they're really forcing air. So they're kind of the predominant controlling force of the air within the rooms. But again, unless we use simulation, we can't really get an idea of what the temperature in the room is going to be like. And the idea is that we want it to be comfortable you know, in any kind of season or conditions. So to jump into um, the application that we're going to look at today, um, we're going to run this building that you see here, and we kind of go through three steps. So we start with a CAD import. So we basically have our model in CAD. It might be um, Rhino or Revit or something else, and we can import that directly into SimScale. Then we set up the simulation. So we tell SimScale what we know. You know, we know the ambient temperatures. We might know where there's heat lost. We might know where there's heat gained. Um, we might know that there's a crosswind. There might not be. But those kind of things are what we tell SimScale. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see that SimScale basically will tell us everything that happens with those given conditions. So, you know, we can look inside the building and get an idea of how the flow is moving, um, what the temperatures are like, would the occupants be comfortable? And then we can start to make design decisions. So, you know, if the flow is too high in one region or there's a draft, what would we do to combat that? And we could make a change in the CAD. Um, again, use the same simulation setup and, um, and then start to compare one design to another. So we're gradually kind of improving and optimizing the design as we go. Okay, so this is a really nice um, cottage. It actually reminds me a lot of England. It makes me miss England a little bit, actually, but it looks nice. 
Um, the garden's nicer than mine, though, I have to be honest. So we're going to look at a couple of things on this type of building. So we have um, a chimney on the obviously on the roof and we have a fire inside so we're going to run like a winter and a summer scenario where we have the fire inside and hopefully that is going to drive a stack effect so there'll be a pretty large temperature differential and flow moving past on the outside too which is normally what you would see um, that will give us an idea of what happens in the winter and then we also want to look at what happens in the summer so this is a building we have a couple of floors You'll see um, the, the chimney on the top and all of the windows as well have um, specific temperatures assigned to them. So you could either make those you know, hot or cold, depending on the, the climate that you're working within. We have ventilation above the windows up here. So all of the windows have almost like a leakage path where air can enter or exit, depending on how the, the flow acts. And the nice thing about that, I think, is it, SimScale will tell us what's really happening. So if the flow you know, in real life would enter, then that is what we'll see. And, and that's exactly what we want. And that's why we want to use simulation. Because those, I mean, especially when we started this, I think what we saw wasn't actually what we expected. And that's why simulation is really powerful because it will tell you the truth of what is going to happen in a situation. And then for the summer setup, we have air conditioning. So we have a couple of um, units inside and they're going to draw air in underneath and cool it down through a cooling system and then push it back out into the room um, so obviously the airflow should essentially be a little faster um, but the idea is that the temperatures should be similar so the occupants should feel equally comfortable within any given season okay so the setup looks a little bit like this and um, we basically place the building within an air box essentially so it's a almost like a wind tunnel and we have the wind coming from the direction that you can see. Uh, the mesh generation was automatic. We did add some refinements in some specific areas, which if anybody asks, I'm happily, I'll happily kind of talk about and go into. Um, otherwise, I won't go into super detail, but let me know if you're interested in that, and we can. And then we use the um, CHT analysis type, so that is um, actually convective heat transfer. Um, so that means exactly what I said before, that the air will behave exactly as you would expect in reality. So there's another type called incompressible where we don't consider buoyancy um, or density changes within the air. And that works when you've got a lot of force convection. But here, um, because we've got temperature and density driving the flow, we need this kind of model to so the air behaves exactly like reality. So we want to make sure that we capture any natural convection effects. Uh, we run it with turbulent. Um, and then on the inlet here, where you can see the arrow coming from, we had a pretty low kind of flow working its way through the wind tunnel and then obviously through the building too so if there's any um, pressure differentials or temperature differentials the air would be drawn into or blown out of the house from all the small kind of leakage paths we have a couple of different setups so on the left hand side we have our winter setup and this is basically where we have a fire and you can see it I mean it doesn't look like a fire right but it's an orange block um, and that is our heat source so we have quite a low outdoor temperature. Actually, can, thinking about Munich, it's not low, but I guess we'll talk about England and it's 10 degrees is pretty pretty feasible. Yeah. Here it gets really cold, by the way, maybe minus 20. Um, and then the idea is to kind of have like a 20 or so indoor temperature. And um, so we have our heat source and we also have some underfloor heating, which is nice. You know, we can kind of turn those things on or off. And that again is like the beauty of um, using simulation generally. Um, not at all specific to SimScale, but really the power of simulation. Again, you know, we could turn the fire on or off. We could turn the underfloor heating on or off. We could have the underfloor heating running at different power outputs, and that would help us understand, you know, how much power do we need to add to get the room to a comfortable level. And that obviously helps you design your system. And then second, we have the summer scenario. So we have a much warmer outdoor temperature. That is like Munich, I would say. Um, but again, we want to have like a nice kind of cool indoor temperature. Um, and we're going to try to maintain that by using the cooling units that you see. So there's one here on the bottom, and we're basically drawing air in, warm air underneath, then kicking out cold air back into the room. And we have a couple of those cooling units uh, placed within the building. Anything you wish to add, Jesus? No, I think it's uh, well explained. I mean, yeah, I mean the, the main thing is to understand that we are trying to force the flow the least as possible and try to natural convection to to work and see the natural work convection how it's making the flow getting in or out of the room so that's the main uh, point of how to set in the the conditions the boundary conditions okay thanks um so this is um sim scale 
obviously all working within the browser and um, these are the types of results that you can see. I'm going to in a second walk through the workflow to get to this point, but I thought we could at least start with what you can see, right? So this is our building um, sitting inside our wind tunnel and we have a cut plane through the middle and this is showing velocity. So the red is kind of the fastest flow and the blue is the lowest. So obviously, you know, above the building here, the flow can go past pretty quickly. Um, we can see the flow coming out of the chimney and um, it's obviously recirculating a little bit behind the building here. So it's a little bit cooler at that point too. The other thing we could do, you know, right now before I go back to the beginning um, is to clip the model and that's basically cutting it in half. So we can say, okay, show me what happens inside. And I might just change the um, scale a tiny little bit here. So basically the scale before was from zero to one meter a second, but if I change it a little bit, um, it'll highlight a, a little bit more, you know, what is happening inside. Um, and by the way, I think a, a nice piece of information to know is that if the flow generally is um, above about 0.2 meters a second, um, we can pretty well ignore natural convection um, because any of the force convection effects will easily dominate the flow field. Um, but here, you know, we have flow that's much lower, so we really, really need to make sure that we're capturing um, any buoyancy effects. So natural convection here is going to play a huge role in what is happening. Okay, so just to go back to the beginning a little bit, there's um, three steps to go through, essentially, to bring your model into SimScale. Um, so here, basically, you'll see that we have our building, and that was imported from CAD. Mm -hmm. um, this was imported as a parasolid, but there's, you know, multiple different ways. Um, we link to Onshape, or you can just drag and drop any kind of CAD file type here. And then we basically run down the tree on the left um, from top to bottom just to kind of go through different steps. So the first one um, is the mesh and actually nobody asked about meshing so I won't talk about this in huge detail. Um, only to say that it's pretty well automated. So there's like a scale from coarse to fine that we can choose from um, and that generates this type of mesh. Um, and basically we need this mesh because SimScale at every kind of point in the mesh is going to calculate every variable that we're asking it to. So it's going to calculate the temperature, the pressure, the flow, um, or the velocity. And so the, the finer the mesh we have, the more kind of granularity we might have in, in the model. And the one kind of rule of thumb to bear in mind is that we want the mesh to represent the real world geometry. So here it looks pretty well like it. And um, so already we could start to feel pretty confident that we have a decent mesh here and we can start to then run. So as I mentioned before, there are lots of different simulation types as well. We're using the convective heat transfer here, um, which is basically um, allowing us to model airflow with buoyancy. Uh, but you also again have FEA, so we could run structural analyses or anything you, you choose. So there's a whole different um, host of different options. And the nice thing is that when you choose one of these, the interface stays the same, but the options are a little bit customized. So we're not kind of showing everything all the time. We're customizing it based on what you're likely to need. Once we are at this point, we need to start telling SimScale what we know. So we know over here on the right hand side, um, we have a velocity inlet. So over here, um, and that basically has one meter a second and it has a, an inlet temperature. So this is our summer condition. So it's a little bit warm. Over on the other side, um, we have our outlet. So that is where the flow is then going to exit. We'll see our building is still on the inside here. Um, and then we have a couple of other different things. So this is actually the summer scenario. So we have inlet cooling. So on the inside here, basically on our air conditioning units, we have air exiting at a cooler temperature. Um, and we then have it also being pulled into those units at a specific flow rate as well. And that pretty much covers the setup. So you, you basically need to import your geometry. Um, you automatically mesh it. And then the, the kind of detail part is here telling SimScale what you know. So we need to make sure that we tell SimScale everything we do know. And then we'll get the, the, the correct results back again. So what I want to do is start to look at, you know, comparing these two things a little bit. So I'm going to jump into the winter scenario. That is really kind of where we started our process as well. So we started with our building with a fire inside and we wanted to obviously understand whether we had the stack effect and where the flow was being pulled out of the chimney. And then, you know, how comfortable were our occupants sitting on the inside? Okay, so this is um, our results. 
I'm just going to turn on one of my cutting planes. So we can basically, I need to kind of explain what I'm showing you, I think. Um, so if I unclip my model, basically, we can see that this is my wind tunnel. Um, I have flow here entering on the right and exiting over on the left. So this is my cutting plane. And I can position it pretty quickly and easily in different directions. So now I've positioned it in the z-axis and we can see it cutting through the building. And obviously the flow is passing you know, over the building. And there's some things going on inside, but until we start to kind of ask what, you know, we don't exactly know. Um, so what I've done is set up a few different kind of clip planes here and I can easily cut the building down. So if I take off the top half of the building and um, we can start to take a look at what is happening in this room down here. So this is where the fire is. And again, I could move my cut plane um, just towards the chimney um, and get an idea, you know, of what the flow, what is happening to the flow on the inside. I think actually I'm going to unclip it so we can show this a little bit better. So this is answering the initial question that we had, you know, what is happening to the flow on the inside and is it getting pulled out of the chimney that we have? And I think the answer there is definitely yes. So we can see the flow all of it exiting the chimney. So that will be in part due to the pressure here, um, but predominantly due to the, the temperature. So we have a fire down here, and this is this cut plane, um, as we can see here, is it's actually showing velocity, but if I change it to temperature, we can see the air temperature in the room, and then we can also see it just here heating up. So on the left, again, we have a scale, so we're going down to 280 Kelvin up to 300. And I've obviously clipped this, and um, the temperature goes way higher where we have a fire. But this gives us a nice kind of um, view of what is happening inside the room too. So most of our occupants, we want them to be you know, somewhere around the 295, 300 Kelvin kind of range to be pretty comfortable. And that is where we're at. So we already know that the occupants are going to be quite comfortable. And we know that the flow is being pulled out through the chimney exactly as we would expect. So it's being heated up by the um, the fire here. The density is dropping and it's rising up and it's exiting and it's joining the flow as it passes over the building. But then we can start to ask some more questions, right? So you know, what is this jet over here and what is happening? So this is basically one of the, um, the leakage paths above the window. And we can see that the flow is coming in here, which is what we would expect. And we can see that it's not coming in too quickly. Um, and then it's spreading out into the room. So I'm just showing it this way so you can see exactly what is happening. So it's entering just here. Um, but if I re-clip the model, we could say not look at temperature, but look at flow rate. So would the occupants actually start to feel a draft here? Um, or is the flow low enough, you know, that it, it, it's not going to be noticeable? So actually, I mean, at, at this kind of range here, at one meter a second where it's coming through here, if you put your hand over this hole, you could easily feel the flow rate. Um, so this is getting, I don't know, to a, like a slow walking pace. Um, but again, very quickly the flow dissipates and slows down. So already around this kind of green area, we're getting down to 0 0.4, 0 0.3 meters a second, and you almost wouldn't notice it. Um, yeah, so our occupants should be pretty comfortable. But the question we have, right, is would they be comfortable in both kind of scenarios? So we need to again go back to temperature and so we know the flow is acceptable, but then we want to make sure that the, the temperatures also are pretty comfortable and acceptable from comparing the winter and the summer design. So within the winter, you know, we're, we're kind of um, in the mid 290s. Um, and in a minute, we'll switch to the other scenario and we can take a look there as well to make sure that the occupants will be comfortable. But what I wanted to do first is um, just trim the model a little bit differently um, and show you some other different ways that we can start to look at results. So we have something called ISO volumes, and they're basically a way of saying, um, or giving a, a scale to view a particular variable. So here we're looking at temperature um, between 293 and 295 Kelvin. So this is like um, an ideal kind of temperature for the occupants inside to be comfortable. And we can see what kind of regions um, that exists. So basically everything within these kind of blobs essentially um, our occupants are going to be pretty comfortable. And I've also shaded this by, temp uh, by velocity. So we're looking at two things at once. So everything, um, everything within this region is a, a comfortable temperature. 
but then we need to make sure that we don't have any kind of high velocity regions that then make that actually feel uncomfortable for the occupants. Um, but we're pretty okay. So most of the velocity, you know, nothing is even close to one meter a second. It's all kind of right in the middle. And that gives us a nice indication, you know, that the occupants will be fairly comfortable. Apart from perhaps down here on the floor, right? So we can start to see things get start moving a little bit faster. Um, and we could, once we start to say, okay, you know, maybe there's a, a region here that is of interest. Um, the, the nice thing, obviously, about simulation is that we can start to, to cut the model up and get an idea of um, what is happening where and where our occupants are going to start to feel uncomfortable um, or comfortable. So I'm just going to put my cup lane somewhere on this first floor. Um, just to get an idea you know, of where this kind of fast region is. Um, and you can see it there just in orange. So it's coming from the stairs here and it's kind of passing across the room. Hey, feel free to chime in, Jesus. You're welcome. Yeah, see, I mean, um, in the results, I could see like there is like some kind of recirculation as well due to uh, the, high, the, the, the flow entering the, the room in, in this uh, front uh, uh, leakages in the wall. And there was creating like some kind of recirculation around the walls and the floor and the ground. So yeah, it's I mean there is also uh, something to take into account when, when designing the ventilation systems that this kind of recirculations can be found. So it could be a really interesting to uh, resolve. Okay, that makes sense. So we can basically add another coupling here, right, and get an idea of. Um, what is happening. So we're basically looking at velocity on both um, and it gives us an idea, you know, not just looking on one flat plane um, but on the one position here too, um, getting an idea of what is happening and how the flow is moving inside. Um, and again, if I just quickly turn those off and go back to the main vertical one um, with some vectors, um, we can see that, yeah, the flow is, is moving quite interestingly and there's some recirculation here, exactly like you said, Ryan. Um, so where the flow is jetting in, it's starting to move around the room, and that is causing some kind of localized acceleration. So potentially at that point, right, it would start to maybe feel a bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the other thing I think we could look at as well, if I turn these off again, um, are traces. So this is basically a particle that we can place somewhere in the model. Um, here we're actually just positioning it next to the fire. I'm going to do it a little bit differently with the, the summer scenario. But basically what we wanted to do is say, okay, if there's some flow originating down here, where does it go? Because what we want to make sure doesn't happen is that flow comes back into the building, obviously, because then the building gets filled with smoke. And we can run a contaminant analysis, but we don't want to. We just want to be sure that everything is leaving. So we have some traces down here, basically, and we can see, you know, we're pretty confident that the flow is exiting up and it's coming out here to the roof and then it's exiting. Okay, and then um, we can dig in a little bit to the summer scenario. So we'll probably run through this a little bit faster than the other one, um, and then we'll jump back to the PowerPoint and take a look at some other results too. Does anybody have any questions so far? Feel free to type them in if you do, and we can probably answer them as we go. Okay, so obviously this takes um, a second to load. Everything again is cloud-based, so I'm not using any kind of local machinery to do this and everything is running on a remote server pretty nicely. Um, so here again, we have our summer scenario. So here's our building again, sitting inside our wind tunnel. And um, I'm just gonna expand this a little bit so we can get an idea of what we're looking at. So on our cut plane here, we're showing velocity. So again, we can get an idea you know, of um, how the flow is moving inside and how it's kind of exiting. Okay, so what we wanted to do is answer the question that we had initially. So are the temperatures inside similar? So I'm going to switch from velocity to temperature on this coupling. And um, we can see that, yeah, you know, we are around this same region. I can actually change the scale a little bit, though, um, to something kind of similar. So we can hone in on this area. So actually, the temperature is very, very uniform internally. Uh, which is good, you know, the occupants aren't going to feel cold and warm spots within the room, and everything is around like 290, 
which is pretty comfortable, especially for the summer, you know, when it's pretty warm outside, considering it's 40 degrees C, which is 313 Kelvin, you know, everything is way warmer, but inside it's, it's much cooler and comfortable. Okay, cool. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, just add a horizontal plane and clip the model. Um, just again, just to take a look at the airspeed inside. So this time, you know, we have active cooling. So the flow should be behaving a tiny bit differently. And the velocities again should be different. So we can see that, yes, you know, the velocities are a little bit faster. Um, but interestingly, the temperatures are uniform, you know, and comfortable. So although the occupants might feel some kind of air movement from the internal cooling, they are not likely to be uncomfortable. I'm just going to spin this around a little bit and um, find one of these cooling units. If I make this see through, it'll be a tiny bit easier to see. Perfect. Okay, so there's one just sitting right inside here, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move the coupling a tiny bit back. Okay, so now we're cutting through one of these units. Um, and what we're basically going to see is the flow, obviously, is a little bit faster around these regions. So it's um, probably flowing along the floor here and up the wall and entering the unit. And then it's being kicked out again um, on the towards the left-hand side of your screen. And if we look at temperature... And what we should see is that the warm air is entering underneath and the cool air is exiting on the side. Actually, everything is so uniform, it's pretty tough to see, right? Um, but that's nice, you know, it means that the occupants, again, are going to feel very comfortable. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I think I mentioned I wanted to look at is the, um, the particle traces. So within this model, um, what we did is have more particle traces so we can have a little bit of a better look at... Um, the flow inside the model, and there's there really are a lot of traces to see, um, but it's pretty nice. It means we can get a really nice idea of how the flow is moving inside. Okay, so we can see, I'm gonna just make this, I'm gonna cut through it so we can see a little bit better. I think this will help. Then we can kind of peek mm. inside the building a little bit. Um, so basically I've turned, I'm just cutting the model in two. Um, basically this gives us an idea of where the flow is moving inside. So how is it moving? Where is it recirculating? Um, and just generally, you know, what is happening to the flow? Um, is it is it flowing? Yeah. Is it recirculating? Is it coming in through the draft um, or above the windows? Or is it leaving those areas? Um, is it flowing through the chimney or not? And we can pretty quickly understand, you know, what is happening inside. Um, so there's obviously a kind of slight recirculation, um, but it's not too severe, you know, so our occupants should be pretty comfortable. Okay, so I'm going to just return to the PowerPoint for a few minutes just to run through some of the slides here. Basically, just summarizing everything that we've looked at and kind of comparing side by side these two studies. So on the left-hand side, always we have the winter study. So this is obviously with the cooler outside and everything being heated up inside. And then on the summer, we have the warm air outside being cooled by the active cooling. So on the left, we can see you know, that the air is entering all of these regions where we have openings above or below the windows, and then it's exiting the chimney. On the right-hand side, actually the flow is predominantly, well, it depends, sometimes it's exiting, sometimes it's entering these regions. And again, that's interesting because we want to make sure, again, you know, if our house is next to a road, for example, we're not bringing in air um, from the road. It's all going out. Um, it gives us a nice understanding of what is happening and, and why. Yeah, I mean, actually, this picture is quite interesting because, um, I mean, yeah, we can see that air in the summer conditions uh, is getting into the room in this front uh, face of the house. But we have this external flow, air flow uh, going in that direction, so uh, due to this uh, forced convection, that's why the flow is entering the, the room. But on the other sides, where there is no uh, direct uh, external, yeah, external flow, um, 
entering into that. It's just natural convection happening due to the difference in temperature. And there we can see that the air is going out. So I think this is an interesting point to, to differentiate between the natural convection and the forced conver convection. Sure. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Okay, so there's a few more slides, right? And um, again, just comparing the two. So this again is an ISO volume and basically showing um, the temperature distribution in each of the two models. And it gives us an idea again of like on the left hand side, we can see the flow almost kind of pouring in um, with the leakage paths above and below the windows. And we can see, you know, where that is going to. And what we want to make sure is not everything is going to the same place, you know, is equally kind of distributed around the room. And then it's obviously exiting on the left hand side through the chimney. And then in the summer scenario, um, we get an idea of how the flow is moving in the room. And again, we use these kind of ISO volumes to understand where we have regions where the occupants will be comfortable or where they'll be uncomfortable. So we're making sure that our design is going to leave our, our people happy and comfortable. Okay. Would you like to add anything else? No. <laughs> cool. Um, so basically this is um, a coupling just looking again with the winter on the left, the summer on the right. Um, but this time looking at temperature. So we can see the on the winter scenario on the left, the cold air kind of entering the room. Um, but it, because we have the floor heating and we have the fire on the left, the, um, the temperatures are being pretty well controlled and being brought um, into a nice kind of comfortable um, feeling quite quickly. And then on the right hand side, um, with the same scale, you know, we have very, very similar internal temperatures, even though the outside is radically different. Yeah. So we're, we're maintaining a nice, comfortable scenario for the occupants in, in both. And then if we move upper floor, so this is going from the ground floor to the upper, um, we have on the, the right hand side, and um, we're looking at velocity here, we have um, some kind of high velocity regions. Um, but again, because we know that the temperature is comfortable, um, you know, it's okay to have those kind of drafts and have the air moving because in the summer that's normally what the occupants would choose. Um, but again, because we're running simulation and we can, we might have the question of whether, what would happen if we turned one of these units off, whether we move the units, you know, whether we just ran with one rather than two, we could really quickly make those changes and get an understanding of what happens to the flow inside, you know, how, how warm does it get or how cold could it be or could we then start to induce some unexpected flow patterns that would be then less desirable for the occupants. Okay, and this is the same again comparing temperatures. I don't think there's too much to say other than we do have like a little hot spot. Um, so within this region, you know, you might actually start to feel a little bit warm because we have a kind of dead area. So our design isn't perfect and we could start to think about how to optimize it to reduce this little hot spot. Um, but otherwise the flow between the two is pretty comparable and the occupants shouldn't feel too much difference, you know, from the winter to the summer. And we thought really just to kind of finally answer the stack effect question, you know, is that actually working in this model? I mean, it, it is, and we can see this is a cut plane cutting through the building and through the chimney. We looked at it live as well. Um, but just zooming in, you know, we can see the flow exiting into where the fire would be and then out through the chimney. So then it kind of joins the flow passing on the outside. Okay, so just in summary, um, We've run a natural ventilation study um, using convective heat transfer with SimScale. We've looked at the winter and summer conditions. So we've looked at what happens when the outside is cold and when the outside or ambient temperatures are warm. Now, how do we use different cooling strategies to maintain a nice, comfortable um, balance internally? Um, we've demonstrated how the stack effect works. So it's pulling air out, um, hopefully not pushing air in You know, when the fire is on in the winter. Um, and we found some areas as well inside where we have um, high areas of temperature or areas of high temperature where we might start to then optimize our design to make the occupants more comfortable. Okay. Um, so one of the questions is, can we incorporate um, solar loading and radiation? Um, we can. We didn't hear actually, um, but you can enable radiation if you want to um, within this type of model. So we could yeah, have um, radiative loads from the windows or from the sun. Um, we actually did it with boundary conditions instead here, which is okay, um, and it's acceptable, and it gave us the comparative kind of study that we wanted to. But yeah, if you wanted to model radiation here, then yes, we, we could have done that also. Um, there's a question as well about um, how we ran this model and how many cores it was run on. Um, so SimScale basically has a load of different machines that we can run on. So if you have a small model, you know, you can run it um, like kind of cost effectively on not many cores. Um, or you can kind of ramp up to the larger machines that we have available and get results a lot, lot faster. 
Um, the solver is very well parallelized, so actually the we have a pretty linear scale here. So you know you, you get a very significant speed up if you choose to run on these larger machines. Um, and this took something like a couple of hours to run. Um, and we could run again everything in parallel as well. So if you had summer and winter scenarios and you wanted to basically answer lots of questions at once, mm -hmm. you could run all of these designs together and then you know start to compare them. So within a couple of hours you can answer all of your your questions. Okay, so actually at this point I don't think we have any other questions. Um at least none that are the super relevant to this and I don't think worth answering. So um yeah, I think that concludes everything we have. If you have a question, uh, I suggest you type it quickly and then um <laughs> we'll answer otherwise we'll um wrap up for today. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening. We have another webinar coming up soon. Uh, feel free to join and I'll hopefully speak to you again next time. Thanks very much.